Welcome back to the Rich Eisen Show. Man loved his work in The Shield. We played Detective Shane Vendrell and then Boyd Crowder in Justified. Just fantastic. Now Billy, uh, baby Billy Freeman in The Righteous Gemstones on HBO. But he is the unicorn on the show called The Unicorn on CBS that airs tonight and every Thursday to 8.30 p.m. Eastern time on CBS. Good to see you, Walton good, Goggins, good man. Here, How are Rich. you? I'm, I'm great, man. I'm, I'm so good. Thank you very much for the invitation. Absolutely. So yeah. now you, let's get right into it. So you're from... You're you're born in Alabama, but then moved to Georgia. Is that yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if as if we're in charge of that. You know, I, know, I was I know, like right. a year old. I know, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, born in a like a like a, a one bedroom trailer. You know, with uh, my mom and my dad, and and uh, I think I think my mom's sisters lived with them for a little while, and yeah. and uh, then moved uh, moved to Atlanta, to Georgia, to yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. To so Atlanta. now your team growing up there would be would be well the what? Atlanta Braves. I mean the tomahawk chopping, baseball popping, ain't no stopping. You know, like during the nineties. <laughs> I mean, but you know, it's like Dale Murphy. You know, back back Dale in the day. Murphy. You know, yeah, Fulton County Stadium and 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 all of that. Did you and, go to Fulton County? Did you see some games? Oh there? God, yeah, 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 yeah. It was uh, uh, you know, I mean where, where I grew up. You know, I grew up in a little town just uh, uh, west of Atlanta. It was kind of the last area to really kind of be developed or consumed by Atlanta. So it was right. still, a, you know, a small town. But, you know, you had God and and barbecue and, and football. You right. Know? And, uh, I mean, you had you had baseball as well. But that was, a you know, it was a big trip to go to, to the Fulton County Stadium and watch the Braves I'm play. I'm sure. Yeah, and Dale Murphy was your guy, huh? Yeah, of course. And Bob Horner. Bob you know, yeah, Warner. Yeah, third baseman. Of course. You know, I can't even believe that I remember that name. No, I had, I, I had about a million Bob Horner baseball cards. Oh, and wow. Dale, but Dale Murphy was a special player, man. A special player. I yeah, know. I think he did this commercial. I just remember, I don't know, I might be wrong, but okay. I remember seeing Dale Murphy do this these these commercials for Kinect ice cream. Okay. I, I don't, you know. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, TBS was a big deal. Like, oh, sure. that's where the Braves played. It was 07 hey. 05 is when the game started. And Marshall Falk grew up uh, in the New Orleans area, one of the greats of all time. And he grew up a Braves fan because uh, the Superstation reached right. all the way across yeah. the Southeast and yeah. then the Gulf South. I mean, yeah. so many yeah. Braves fans in places far away from yeah, Georgia because of that Superstation. That, cities that didn't have teams, right, always had the, yeah. the Braves, and I think that's for the reason why their moniker was uh, the America's team. America's team. I yeah. remember all that. And yeah. then, you know, obviously the Glavin, Smoltz, Maddox era, the Bobby Cox Unbelievable. era. Unbelievable. I mean, well, the moment, like, uh, where where Sid Bream scored on that Francisco Cabrera, Cabrera. Oh, yeah. Cabrera, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I was with, you know, all of my friends. I, I was living out here at the time. Right. But happened to kind of be back there for that experience and, and watched it in, in Buckhead, uh, this little bitty area oh, in, sure. in Atlanta. Oh, sure. Right. Of before, it, before it changed. Back before, when it was like. Back when Buckhead yeah, was yeah, an yeah, outpost. But, yeah. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and it was extraordinary. It was just, you know, what what that moment, like uh, what sports does for people, man. It's right. really extraordinary. It brings everyone together. And yeah. obviously, you know, Atlanta fans so starving. You know, the Falcons coming so close in the Super Bowl up 28 to 3 a couple of years ago. And, yeah. You know, and, and Chris is, uh, is, you know, what? Your your girlfriend, your your uh, partner. your partner, your life partner, about yes. to give birth to a child. She's a diehard Atlanta and Georgia sports fan. So wow. I have got. It's funny. I've got a list of names of Atlanta sports fans, <laughs> sports <laughs> names that we've been joking. He's going to name his child wow. after. You know, and, well, and you know, interesting I, that some of the names you have mentioned are on this list. What about what? Well, I mean, I because also when I when I lived in Atlanta uh, this this year after I I, I I I didn't graduate college, but like my my summer break or whatever after mm -hmm. my freshman year of college, mm -hmm. I uh, Valley parked for, uh, uh, for, for a club owned by Dominic Wilkins. And it was called, you know, Dominic's. And, uh, and then I think it went to Evander Holyfield. And I, it was, just, you know, it was a super cool club in Atlanta. And, uh, and it was just me. I man the parking lot by myself. <laughs> and man, I'm, I'm like, man, I was making $600 Seven hundred dollars a night. Come on! In nineteen ninety, man. Like wow. I mean, it was extraordinary. Parking like like literally twenty cars, and uh, and they just they all liked me. I was cool, and uh, and um, and I just kind of hung out with their you know all of their Benzes. So, <laughs> <laughs> did you take so any great. for a joyride? You take any for a you ride? know? I I mean that couple. You know, I'm sorry, Vander. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I took a couple around, but you know, I mean, I had like you know some some great stories, and it was a, it was a place to be seen, man. It was a real like uh, kind of moment, like in, in Atlanta's history, and uh, and it was this one time that this uh, this guy, 
This is pre-cell phones, right? I mean, they sure. had car phones, but they're the big, yeah, the sure. big car phones. Yeah, yeah. And there was this guy, man, and he was just going back and forth in my lot, and I was really protective of my lot and protective of, of all these dudes' cars because they were paying me fifty bucks a pop. And it's Dominique Wilkins. It's Dominique Wilkins, spot. man. It's a cool club, yeah. and he had this phone, and he was going back and forth with this loud music, and and at one point in the night. He was, he was still doing it, and the, and the bouncer in the club ran out and said, call 911, call 911. A fight had broken out, mm -hmm. and there was no phone around. So I saw this guy, and I went running up to him, and I said, dude, I, I got to use your phone. You got to call the police. You got to call the, call, call the police. And he just looked, and he said, it's fake. It's fake. It's fake. <laughs> it, was like, it, was the, it was a fake phone. He'd been having fake conversations for an hour. On this phone. <laughs> I heard him having conversations out loud on this phone. It was fake. So you called him out just because it's emergency. <laughs> and I didn't even fake. mean to. That's fantastic. It's so wow. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> but it was great. Walton Goggins here on the Rich Eisen Show. Before we get into the unicorn, I got to ask you about some other shows. Um, Justified. How did you get into the role of Boyd Crowder? That was some really dark, deep stuff that you were bringing to the screen. Thank in that you. Know, show. Thank you very much for saying you are that. Welcome. Uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, first and foremost is based on a short story, you know, by Elmore Leonard, and um, who is one of our great uh, fiction writers, mm -hmm. and um, and so much so that you know it's the only movie that Quentin has made, um, Jackie Brown, other than something that he's penned. Right. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't know. I just put him up there with with the best. And uh, and so when I when I read the pilot for the first time, I actually turned it down twice, um, uh, because I, the things that he was saying, you know, and I, I didn't want to see my culture mm -hmm. yet depicted again um, through such a narrow narrow kind of uh, point of view, mm -hmm. you know. And um, and so. I said, look, in order for me to do this, and, and FX, they're really good friends of mine. Um, and, and Tim wasn't a friend, but, you know, kind of became a friend. Uh, yes. Uh, but I said to, to Graham Yost, our uh, creator, and to Michael Denner, our director, I said, I just need two things. I, I need um, for, for Tim to say that, uh, you know, I know that you don't believe this, mm -hmm. you know, that you're saying it um, because you want people to, to, to worship you, if you will, or sure. whatever you, you, you get off on having followers. And there was something else that I said, and uh, and they said, okay, um, would you, you you'll do it if we do those two things? I said, yep, absolutely, and um, and it was the chemistry was just there on, on amazing day television, man. Thanks, amazing man. television, Thank and you. the writing was incredible, and the way you brought it to life. And you, Tim, you're referring to as Tim Oliphant, who played you know Raylan Givens, who was. Yeah. Um, who was trying to put you behind bars for so many years in that show. Yeah, you know, but I mean, it really kind of explored, like, you know, I come from this part of the world, and, uh, and you know, uh, all of my buddies, you know, I have buddies that, that join the service. I mean, I'm the only guy, at, I say I had 10 of my best friends uh, in my high school, eight of them joined the military. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you did, you know, um, if you wanted to kind of get out. I... I chose to go to Los Angeles, man. I chose to become like like an actor, mm -hmm. or really just kind of see the world. And and um, you know they had an incident happen at basic training, and and that forever cemented their bond with the people that they went through that with that experience with. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with digging coal. The same thing with anything that you do in one's youth. Uh, whenever you experience trauma together or, or or difficult periods in your life, you are forever tied to that person. Even if you have a different political point of view or, or if you uh, come from a, a different uh, kind of uh, uh, status in, uh, economically in society, whatever that is, mm -hmm. you have that, the commonality of that experience. And, and that's what these two men had. And, and, um, and at the end of it, I think we all just wanted to see where it would take us. And like uh, Tim Oliphant, you have been in a Quentin Tarantino film, as you mentioned Quentin uh, before. Uh, Tim was just in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. You were in Django Unchained. Uh, Oliphant told a, uh, a well, fascinating- Well, and the Hateful Eight. Hateful yeah, Eight, I mean, too. Uh, know, don't forget yeah, about that, too. Don't forget Sorry. about that one. Pardon, far, pardon me on that front. <laughs> Sorry. But, but um, yeah, hey, look, when you're in a, in one of a Quentin Tarantino film, you, it should be properly counted. Um, he, old fan told an incredible story about how no cell phones were allowed uh, on the set. You needed to just focus and what Tarantino was like. What was he like to deal with? You know, I mean, you, I, I, well, I, don't, I don't think like it's like not to, to deal with, I, I right. suppose, to just be in the, the to be the, with to be in his company. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no person that I have I have worked with over the course of my 30 years uh, in this business that has ever been more infectious who's you know their their energy has born been more infectious 
and their their love and their deep understanding of of storytelling. Um, you know, he lives it and he, and he breathes it, and um, and it and it and it goes out to those who are fortunate enough to get the opportunity to work with him. Um, all boats rise on his set, and uh, and it was an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I can call him my friend. And then, um, you know, man, you just do so many intense things. The Shield. Did you realize at the time what that show was like? You know, I, I know. I mean, I know that? Michael Chiklis has been on your show um, uh, yep. a few times, mm -hmm. and uh, and and none of none of us did. No, nobody knew what FX was. You know, I was a time mm -hmm. in my life where you know I, I'd been fortunate enough to do movies. For, for a number of years, um, but anything really in television and network television, um, which was really kind of the only game in town, uh, I don't have a face for that. <laughs> you know, like that, that's that's just people didn't look at me uh, back then. People barely look at me now nice. and think uh, until now, right? Um, and think like, uh, yeah, that guy's perfect for Beverly Hills 90210. Yeah, we'll take him. <laughs> um, but it but it took uh, um, you know, the FX kind of coming up and, and, and HBO, The Sopranos really right. was, was, was the first, but um, The Shield was uh, number two. You know, mm -hmm. we were on the air like six months after The Sopranos and, um, and it took that kind of uh, gritty storytelling, I suppose, uh, for people like me to, to, to get a shot. Right. And, um, and when we were doing the pilot here in LA, um, you know, I remember no one knew kind of what was permissible and, and not permissible, like uh, in regards to language, in regards to uh, you know smoking and and uh, and I and I actually said this once and I said man can I can I have a cigarette while we wash this car at this car wash while this drug deal is going mm -hmm. down and so they all looked at each other and said uh, sure uh, yeah go ahead yeah go, why not I don't know go for it and uh, <laughs> and, and and you know kind of everything about that show and it was only after that we did the pilot and um, and this was you know but pre 9 11 and then the pickup was post 9 11 right. and the conversations that took place. Um, in order to kind of make that decision. But when when it first kind of came out and that first episode came out, it's like, man, we might be sitting on something here. And um, and But Sean Ryan and the rest of us told that first season uh, as if we would never get another season. And um, if you watch it, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, mm -hmm. and one where we could all kind of walk away from. And little did we know that um, we were going to be some of the first actors um, alive, really, to be uh, going through you know, an 84 hour exp uh, um, uh, exploration of, of, of what, it, what it means to be these people that we're portraying. It was extraordinary, man, I, really. And I, th I, think, I think anyone on The Sopranos would say the exact same thing. I mean, out of the gate, I and mean, I know Brian Cranston would say the same thing. About Breaking Bad. You know? yeah. yeah, I mean, anybody that's getting, gotten the opportunity to tell a story, a serialized story, right. over, over 85 hours. Um, you know, you leave no stone unturned, and, and we certainly didn't do that on The Shield. Walton Goggins here on The Rich Eisen Show, and now you're the unicorn, bro. I mean, I mean network television. Network. How about that? Television. You just stay around long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you now, wear them down. Now you're that single father trying to find a new life with your after your wife passed, and now you're the unicorn because... You're walking around town, and and you're a catch. This is you're the catch yeah. of Los Angeles. How about how about that? I think if you, know, you could I, only I get past all of what's going on between your temples, man. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I I, I again, I, I never really saw myself in, in network television. I, I stopped thinking about that um, a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And um, but you know, like like a lot of actors, I really kind of follow the words on the page, and what's the best kind of thing out there. And uh, and when this came across uh, my desk, I read it and thought, wow, you know, um, if they were to do this, uh, you know, a different way, mm -hmm. I don't know if they would really kind of be up for that, but if they were to let me do my thing, regardless of whether or not it got picked up, I, I think it could actually do some good in the world and something that, that I would like to be a part of. And um, and so, you know, I, I met with them, it was the invitation to, to meet with them. And one of the producers is a guy named Peyton Reed, um, who is a, a good friend of mine. He directed Ant-Man and the Wasp. And, um, and his two friends, um, our writers, Bill Martin and Mike Schiff. Mm -hmm. And they wrote this story based on their best friend who from college, and, and he lost his wife uh, to cancer, um, very young, and he had two teenage daughters. And, um, and a year into his grieving process, he looked at his friends that were writers and said, do you think this would make a good television show? And they said, but we've been waiting for a year right i didn't say no, -C -K. Almost, I no, no, no careful but you did spell but I didn't it say it <laughs> yeah 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 okay as if you don't know what that means uh yeah um he said, he said they said yes this would make a great show yeah 
And, uh, and and so here we are, man. We we did it, and uh, it's just funny too. It's got a sweet center. I mean, we've had Omar Miller and Rob Cordry on to talk about it too. Yeah. So oh, you have. Yes, yeah, we yeah, are yeah. quite familiar with your show, sir. Yeah, there you go. And the same with your work. How in the well, world? Well, you know what? I'll I'll yeah. say this. You know, sure. uh, like I don't know. For me, I. I'm 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 an earnest guy. I'm not a quippy guy. Right. It's just not my thing. I, I suppose my humor comes from storytelling uh -huh. or situational humor. You right. know, uh, I'm not a I'm not a comedian, and I don't want to be a comedian. I want to be me. Right. And um, but but this story for me, as funny as it is, we knew it would be funny. And I told CBS, I said, pr I promise you, will it'll be funny. Mm -hmm. But we gotta land it. I don't think you can talk about this kind of thing without really going there emotionally yeah. and uh, and all of the people at CBS were so unbelievably supportive right out of the gate, regardless again, whether or not we got picked up. Right. Um, but the thing that I, I will say that I want to say on, on your show, because I haven't really said this anywhere else, um, is that, look, man, we all, we all grieve, you know, we all go through difficult periods in our life. And I think most of us, like even empty nesters, you know, like, like a child going off to college or the loss of a pet, whatever that is, let alone the loss of a spouse or the loss of a child or the loss of a job, I think it's in those moments that we feel most isolated. We feel most alone and that uh, that there is no one there to grieve us. And, and my intention, the only reason that I did this show because I've been there is to say that, you know what, we're not alone and that you're not the first person to go through it and you won't be the last. And, and if we can put something out into the world where most content, most comedy is is cynical, which is funny as I can say <laughs> on the air. Like, uh, it's funny. Uh, I can say that. I can say <laughs> on no, 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 I lost a parent too, and I'm yeah. here for you. Yeah, man. I'm here for you. Reached out. Yeah. People I hadn't heard from a while. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? I was alone, and I, I actually joined this club that I had no well, idea that existed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it is just you know getting together and talking it out. Yeah, man. Is so helpful. And if we, and and if we, that's what if we could create this show and tell this story, right? That might ease that burden or make people look at their situation and how absurd it, it is, yes. and it can be, that it might lighten their load, you know? And um, and I, I'm here to tell you, man, I, you know, a year into the, or eight months into this now, um, I've been stopped on the street and uh, and I've become a repository for other people's grieving. Good for you. And uh, and I and I love it, it Good for you. I do, I love it. Yeah, good and I've you. been there with my, my mother, and I'll just say this, I, I haven't sure. lost a parent yet, but but my mom went through some tough times and, uh, and I had to move her to Los Angeles. Yeah. And I'm, I'm alone, you know, I'm an only child. I mean, I have a half brother with my dad. It's a long story. Right. Um, and he's 14 years younger than me, but with my mom, I'm alone. And um, and I, I didn't know where to go, Rich. I, I have no idea. Like, I don't know, how do I take care of my mom? She said, we always had our little house. And right. our agreement was, you take care of your side of the street, I'll take care of mine. And, and, and I had to look for a place out here and I was just overwhelmed and consumed with all of these decisions and responsibilities. And um, I'll make this quick, I promise. Uh -huh. And I went into this... Uh, into this facility where she is here. It's just a, a retirement community. Mm -hmm. And and I walked out and I I was just bawling. Like, how can I how can I do this? I don't know what to do. And I looked up and I saw a guy walking down the street who was bawling with two bags of groceries. And I said, Dan? He said, Walton? I said, what are you doing here? He said, I just moved my mom in here last night. And I said, oh my God. And he just walked me through his process. And it's like, I'm not alone. He You're just, not. he's going through it. All of my other friends are going through it. If we just only have the courage to actually communicate, That's right. man. That's, That's exactly it really right. is. Sometimes you just don't have the courage to do it. Or you think you're, you get stepping out of your skin, but... Again, that's what a show like The Unicorn's all about. Thursdays Thanks, uh, at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, including tonight that's right. on CBS. Can you stick around for one television segment? Just one, like two more minute segment? Because I wanted to ask you about Danny McBride before you go. Well, I, I, I just got to do I it. I want to talk about Danny Okay, McBride. I got about a two minute segment. That's next with uh, Walton Goggins right here on The Rich Eisen Show. For more of The Rich Eisen Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV for free on BR Live or download The Rich Eisen Show app.